on this edition of Thinking Biblically, the Reader's Digest version of my God's Epic Story Seminar. It's not really the Reader's Digest version, that's just an expression. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all of Scripture speaks to all of life. A little while ago, I was asked by Greenbelt Church in the east end of Ottawa if I would come and speak on five Sundays over the course of four months. So I thought, why don't I do my God's Epic Story seminar in this kind of format? Now, of course, I had to condense it because normally the seminar takes about nine hours to do, and so I tweaked it, and uh, this past Sunday was the fifth and final installment, and uh, because the last time I was there was about a month ago, I thought I needed to do a substantial review. I was a bit apprehensive about this one because I had a lot to cover, as I was also doing the, the final installment is called The Future Hope. So there's a lot to cover. But as it turned out, I was quite delighted by how I was able to condense the first four weeks and and get into the, the, the fifth installment substantially so. So anyway, I thought I would share that with you. And my Epic Story Seminar really captures what it is I'm trying to do in terms of thinking biblically as I draw people into God's story. And that's how you could discover your own story. You could only do that when you discover God's story. Anyway, so why don't we get right into it, and then I'll see you on the other side. The universe that God made is a storied world that we all have come into existence through some sort of story. Our life is a story. The reason why we love story, well, we connect with story, why we remember the illustrations and sermons more than the main points is because God made a storied world. The reason why the scriptures have what we could technically call a narrative framework is because it reflects a world that God created that exists within a narrative framework. Sadly, a lot of us have been educated in in a way that we think, we've been taught to think of life in these categories. We've been taught scripture very often through what we call propositional truths. We take stories, mainly almost all the Bible is story or within the context of a story, and we often think the name of the theological game is to reduce the stories into various points that it mean you know, tr- truth statements. And then we and when we do that, we detach it from the the story context. But as I think I may have mentioned, when God becomes a man and people throw at him very difficult theological and life type questions, he ends up answering in story. Why does he do that? Because I believe we live in a storied world. And for us to properly understand the Bible, I think we need to keep it within its narrative or storied context or or framework. So let me more or less quickly go over what we tried to cover the last four segments. I started off by um, a section called Welcome to Planet Earth, uh, which which sets up the stage of the whole biblical story that God created a very good world. And he put human beings to serve him within this world and known. We're going to be talking about future things. That's the main thing we'll be talking about this morning. But notice if you read the whole Bible, where do we end up at the end? We end up on a renewed earth where the new Jerusalem comes out of heaven to earth and the kings of the earth bring their gifts to this new Jerusalem. And that's not really how we think of, the st- of, of our, our destination. So many songs, so many teachings, so many uh, comments that we make, it would be easy to believe that actually where our destiny is, is in a disembodied heavenly existence. We hear that all the time, but is that Bible? Bible has God glorifying his name through human beings on earth forever. And unless we understand that, we're going to have a hard time learning how to serve him now because 
This is going to become that. This doesn't become something so different that we can't relate to it. It's going to be greater than anything that we could imagine, but this becomes that. What we do now makes a difference for forever. This counts. This really, really counts. Your problems matter, not all of them. (laughs) Some of them we're making too much of a big deal out of. But there are real problems that God wants to see us deal with individually in our families, in our churches, in our societies. So God made a very good world and he put human beings to be his representatives. I said all that time ago that that's the, what being made in the image of God means. An image is a representative of that which it represents. We're made in the image of God. We are God's representatives on earth. And that's why when our first parents, Adam and Eve, to use the technical term, blew it, it, it had such a horrible effect. And, and you know, people, are, they struggle with, well, believers, non-believers, what, why all the evil? And why would a good God let all the evil things happen? Well, I really do think the answer is, it's our fault. It's our fault. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame your grandparents. It's just how it works. Once we inherit, it, inherit whatever we inherit, the good, the bad, and the ugly from our background, now it's our responsibility to deal with it. Uh, understanding the past, sure. Understanding what the, the trauma that grandma went through when she had to marry grandpa and all the things that happened and they were immigrants and, and their, their struggles and all the firings that grandpa had to go through. I'm making this up. Maybe it applies to some of you. And how that was passed down, all that trauma was passed on to you. That, that's important, but don't blame them. God, by the, his grace, has given us the resources to deal with all that stuff. But when we don't um, d- deal with what God has called us to be responsible for, it causes serious damage. It, that's how, that's, you might resent God for making a world like that, but that is the world that he made. And he values human responsibility so much that he allows us to ruin things really, really badly because he wants us to grow up and he wants us to be responsible. He wants us to trust him and he wants us to be part of his great redemption plan for planet earth. And that's, that's part of, the, of what drives the story of the Bible because when our first parents blew it, God, in that moment after he, he cursed everything, which is why the world is broken like it is, there was already a, a, an anticipation that one day someone would come who would completely destroy evil. Mm-hmm. At this, when God cursed everything, he didn't do it, he didn't completely make planet Earth into a piece of junk. Even though that's how sometimes people think about this world. Which God's just going to throw it out. He's just enduring this junk-like existence, this garbage-like existence until Jesus comes back and then he's, then he's going to take us away to something completely different. That's not what the Bible teaches. The heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, in Romans 1, it talks about how God, even now, reveals himself through the creation. How could he do that if it's a piece of junk? It is a beautiful world. You don't have to feel guilty when you go on vacation and you see beautiful mountains or a lovely lake or the ocean. And that's all designed, partly designed to give God glory. But not just so that we get so obsessed with God and not appreciate the the natural world in which we live in, but that we can connect the reality of that we live in a created world. And, And we're the ones, if we know him, we can help people connect with the reality that this piece of art has an artist. Imagine going to the, to the art gallery and, and, and you're watching somebody appreciate uh, a piece of art, but you know the artist. And their artist is standing next to you and you can introduce the person who loves the painting to the artist. And that's what we get to do. Because this is a beautiful, complex, extraordinary world where God still glorifies him, even though it's so messed up. But God determined that he would 
he would restore this incredible creation. And we see in Genesis chapter 12, the beginning of the outworking of, of his um, of his promise of of restoration by calling Abraham. uh, His name was Abram, changed to Abraham uh, later. And that through him, his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, God determined to bring his blessing to all the nations of the world. Explain how the word blessing means to fill, uh, fill something with the potential for life and contrasting curse, which is to suck the life out of something. So through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, God determined to bring his blessings to the whole world. Um, and so through this chosen nation, God revealed himself uh, to them, through them to the whole world. And he did it by rescuing them from Egypt where they were trapped. And that's like a picture of the trap that we're all in due to our rebellion. He releases the the people of Israel from bondage to to slavery in Egypt, brings them to Mount Sinai, reveals his word to them. I talked about the term Torah, often translated law, which often doesn't, uh, it doesn't give the right impression. The word actually means teaching or direction. God reveals his character to them. He reveals his ways to them, uh, explains to them that if they follow in his ways, they'll be blessed. If they disregard his ways, they'd be cursed, which is exactly what happened. They, like any other people on earth, could not live up to God's standards and show the world what happens when God shows you how to live. We don't do it. We fail. And that was all designed to show the world our need of someone who would come and be our rescuer, which is the whole story, the anticipation of, and then the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah comes, and uh, we were familiar with the term gospel, which is actually an old English word to mean good news, but it's connected to the, the proclamation of God as king. And so the people of Israel, that's the story in the Gospels, the people of Israel were commissioned to go and proclaim this wonderful truth that the king had finally come and that through him, we can be restored to the image of God and be the people that God wanted us to be. Um, And so I have a little summary that I wish I would have had the last time, but um, I was looking for something because a lot of the concepts that I'm sharing, I think obviously they're quite big. Um, and so we're touching on a lot of big things, but there's this wonderful thing that Paul says in Galatians chapter one, verses three to five, that summarizes what the gospel really has accomplished. He writes, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God, our father, of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, for some people, when we read to deliver us from the present evil age, that sounds like God's going to take us and send us out of this world and to a completely other existence, rather than the biblical idea that through the Messiah, we can be freed from the oppression of the curse that God brought in the Garden of Eden, and we could live as, as new, like heavenly people now because of how Jesus broke the power of sin and death. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't simply about um, telling people that um, Jesus died and died for your sins and rose from the dead. That he died and rose from the dead is what makes the gospel possible. And now we can receive the reality of of the kingly rule of God in our lives and proclaim that rule to others. So we could actually live now with a taste of what the Bible calls the age to come. That through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we can be now God's image on earth and represent God throughout the world and bring his reality and bring his forgiveness and bring his reconciliation and bring his healing to people. What a wonderful mission we have been called to. And so that brings us to what I call the future hope. And so we're going to cover four things rather quickly. Um, So the outline for the rest of the morning is first what I call the eschatological conundrum. Yeah, 
like that, eh? Um, I'll explain what that means, the eschatological conundrum. Then we're going to look at hopeful expectation. How then shall we live? Then the new creation. And um, we're going to kind of then go back and I'm going to close with something that's most essential to God's epic story and that's Israel's restoration. So as I said, the future hope itself is a really big topic. Um, And... um, So I'm going to focus on some key points. So we're going to start off with the eschatological conundrum. So eschatology is the study of end things. Now I'm tempted to call this instead of the eschatological conundrum, the eschatological disaster. Because of how messed up I believe so much end times teaching is. And um, I'm not going to pull any punches on this topic because I think this is, this is split churches. This has messed up God's people. This has undermined how God wants us to anticipate the future things and how we are to live in this day. It's very, very serious. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of this because being Jewish believers, um, very quickly, well, I'll speak for myself right now. So my first year as a believer, I quickly learned about all the, the divisions and, and opinions about the end times um, and organizations and, and, and churches that are divided over this and, um, and the obsession. And there's, a, there's an obsession with the timetable. Um, and maybe you've seen prophetic charts and some of these things, but here, here's the thing that just gets me. I'm just being honest with you. I try to always be honest. And that is, so um, something bad happens. Usually, you know, something, I don't mean personally, but a little more worldwide. And then this is what I hear people say. This must really be the end times. I think we're really getting close to the end times. I don't know why they talk with this low voice, <laughs> but they get really serious. I you know, I think Jesus is coming back soon. I think he's about to come back. This has got to be the beginning of the end. But here's what gets me. Do you know how long people have been saying that? (laughs) And we're talking hundreds of years. And if I had time, I'd do the research and show all the various ways. You know, Jesus said, no one knows the time or hour. (laughs) Oh, but people think they know better than Jesus and they've written the books and they've done the movies and they've done all the sorts of things. And, and before books, not before books, but before movies, people have been doing this. But the thing that gets me is like, oh, I really think now is the time. I really think now is the time. Well, <laughs> what does the New Testament teach? The New Testament teaches, I really think now is the time. That's what it teaches. So there are people, if you really get into some of the scholarly things, you're going to see that the early believers thought Jesus was coming back really, really soon. And that's the right view. That is the right view. And like, well, wait a second, how could that be the right view? Because soon hasn't happened yet. Well, one day soon will happen. But there's something about a relationship to this anticipation that's about soon. And how we're supposed to behave like it's soon. And for some of you today, sadly to speak one way or another, it's soon. Because either he's going to come or we're going to go. And that is what the Bible teaches. That if we are not prepared for our death today, we've waited too long. (laughs) At least somebody does. (laughs) So, so it is, you know, people have literally, a lot of people say literally all the time, but this is true. Literally, people have um, um, tried to paint for us all the details with what the end times is supposed to be like. And again, there are whole churches that are, are established in some of these ideas. Um, and there was, a, there was an illustration I wanted to do, do a picture of something, but it was too much work. So you're just going to have to rem- uh, uh, f- um, pictured in your mind. What I wanted to do is I wanted to bring up a whole bunch of dots, like follow the dots. Start off with just the dots. He, so here's my experience. I've been, we've been in so many different churches across Canada through the years and the books that I've read and all the rest. And so the whole thing about the end times, is Bi- Bible actually calls it the last days. But uh, what I've seen is it's as if there's all these dots 
And then somebody comes along and they add the numbers after. So all we've, so okay, so there's this dot here where the Bible says this, a dot there, the Bible says this, a dot over here, the Bible says this, and dot over there. The Bible doesn't tell us how they're connected. Ah, but there are teachers that think they know. So then they come and they add the numbers. And by adding the numbers, it creates a picture. And then they say, see, this is how the end times works. But then somebody else comes along and goes, no, 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 no. Here are the dots, but the numbers work like this and create another picture, a different picture. And there's, there's a further problem with this, uh, what I think is a made up fall the dots thing, is some of the dots are made up too. Or some of the dots are bigger or smaller than really what people say. There's an, actually, there's interpretation upon interpretation upon interpretation before you even get some of these dots. Then we divide over these dots and then we don't even understand, even if that is a dot, what the dot is there for. And that's what I'm going to try to share with you in, in very few minutes. So don't have time to look at all of Matthew 24 and 25, but this is one of the largest sections about end things, the last days. It begins, Matthew 24, verses 1 to 3, with a couple of questions, which I, I will I'll show you how they're actually confusing. So it goes like this. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left, le left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're asking a complex question. It's possible that they were thinking that the destruction of the temple and the coming of Jesus was going to be one event. Historically, we know the destruction of the temple happened in 70 AD, but we're still waiting for the Lord to return. So whether they understood it or not, they were asking a very complex question to which he gives a very long complex answer. What he doesn't provide, in my opinion, are, is the timeline of events because he doesn't even deal with that issue. So very quickly, I'm going to give you an outline of these answers because what he does is he answers almost two old chapters for us, they're chapters now, and then he, you know, he was talking to them. He answers their complex question about the destruction of the temple and his return with several parables. And that alone, back again, like what parables are difficult to understand, but I think the main point, main points, the main point of these parables is clear. I'm going to go over it quickly. You could read the chapters yourself after. So here we go. So what he tells them in response to their concern about the destruction of the temple and his coming is, are, don't be led astray, 24, uh, verse four, endurance is essential. 24.13. Have confidence in Jesus' words. 24.35. Stay awake. 24.42. Be prepared. 24.44. Remain faithful. 24.45 and following. Stay alert. Pay attention. 25 verse 1 and following. Use your abilities, your talents. 25.14 to 30. And do God's will, especially in helping the needy. 25.31 and following. The Focus is not so much on the future, but on how we live in light of the future. That's his point. The reason why the Bible talks about end things is not so that we can go, I think Jesus is coming really soon, but rather shape up people before it's too late. That's the message. And get that right. After we get that all cleaned up and fixed up and we're doing it properly, maybe we could talk about other things, but I have a feeling we're not going to want to because we're going to be busy doing God's will. You know, there, you know, there aren't very many hell passages in the Bible. There are some, but there aren't many. Do you know what one of them is in chapter 25, the parable of the talents? And you know, you, I imagine you know that you have the 10 talents, the five talents, the one talent, and the guy with the one, he's freaked out because he's, he's serving this hard master. 
And the master agrees that he's a hard master. And so he thought he did the, the careful, cautious thing by hiding the talent away because he knew it, was, it would be risky to try to do something with that one talent. He might lose it. Then what is the master going to say? So he hides it away. He puts it in his safety deposit box. He thinks that's the right thing to do. But then when it comes time to give an account to the master and, and he tells him what he did, and he said, you knew what I was like? He said, you should have risked the one talent. And you know where that guy goes? He goes to hell. Read the passage. Read the passage. I don't fully know what to do with it, but I know how to respond to it. Get up, get going, and even if you think you only have this little tiny bit to offer to God, use it before it's too late. That's what the end times passages are for. Okay, so that brings us to the new creation. Romans 8, 18 to 25 is one example of, of how the Bible reflects this. For I consider, Paul writes, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, that's the curse, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The old English, older English word long suffering is more um, fitting um, because it's, it can be tough and waiting isn't simply like waiting for the bus at the bus stop. Oh, when's the bus coming? It's being actively involved in expectant hope for what is coming. Paul uh, is, is convinced because this is the way it is, that what's coming is, is, way, is way greater than anything we're experiencing now. It makes all the hardship, hard times and suffering, in a sense, worth it. We have much to look forward to, but what are we, look for, uh, what are we looking forward to? Is the, the, um, being, the, the creation itself being set free from its bondage to corruption? Are we picturing that one day planet Earth is going to be like the planet Krypton and blow up? And some people will be like, like, uh, like Superman and be jettisoned to some other place? That's how so many Christians think about the future. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches in a renewed Earth where righteousness will reign forever. And those who know the Lord will be part of that. And Paul expounds the meaning of the resurrection in one of the longest chapters in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, and that chapter is dedicated to the resurrection. Um, and just as a little bit of an aside, um, the evangelical church tends to be really, really focused on the death of Jesus as if that would have been enough, but the New Testament does not see it that way. It's his death and his resurrection. It's his resurrection that makes sense of his death. Without, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, without his resurrection, we'd still be in our sins. Okay. And um, understanding Jesus' resurrection, uh, where he was able to go through walls and yet he was also able to eat and so on, helps to understand what we're looking forward to in our resurrected bodies. So Paul goes through all sorts of things about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, and this is what he ends with. Therefore, my beloved brothers, in verse 58, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So in the context of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's encouragement to get going, be who God calls you to be, use your talents and your gifts for the glory of God is all connected somehow to our expectation of the resurrection. There's something about how we live now that's connected to what is coming. Okay, so now I want to talk about a very important piece of, uh, of the future hope and something that ties up the, um, the whole epic story and has to do with Israel's restoration. Uh, and that's because to understand God's epic story is to, un you need to understand the story of the people of Israel. 
Because the story of the Bible, the story framework is really the story of Israel. I know for a lot of people, the Bible's about the story of Jesus. I might have mentioned this weeks ago. So it's a very common theological approach is to find in the scriptures the golden thread of Jesus, um, which is that golden thread is there through the prophecies, through his coming, through the expectation of his return, um, through his presence with us by the Holy Spirit. Certainly there is that golden thread, but that's a thread of the story. It's an essential thread of the story. It's core to the story, but it's not the story. The story is what began to become unfolded when God called Abraham. The story of God's rescue operation of planet earth that was going to happen through the people of Israel. And by the way, it has happened through the people of Israel, not only because it's the king of Israel who's currently reigning and who we're expecting to return, but who were the ones that he originally prepared and sent out to to fulfill this purpose in the whole world it was a remnant of the people of Israel. The story of Israel is still unfolding. That's why it's, it's one of the reasons why the current events we're facing really, really matter because there's a story that's going on and there's, there's, there's characters in, 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 at the, who are part of the story that are important in the, un, in the, the working out of that, of that story. I'm trying to say a lot of things in a short period of time. Um, the Bible actually stands on a covenantal promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where he gave to them an unconditional promise to be a people, to have a land. And yet as the story goes, because we were the ones who were chosen, we, in case you don't know, if you haven't been here before, Rob and I are both Jewish, Jewish believers in Jesus. Um, we, were, we were the ones chosen to carry the burden of bringing the knowledge of God to the world. But that having that burden also crushed us because human beings on their own can't do that and we end up failing. But God had made an unconditional promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so biblically speaking, he's still bound to that promise even though most Jewish people are like most people in Ottawa. Um, Atheists, agnostic, just, they're just, folks, just like everybody else, except with a certain kind of call on us because we were the ones chosen to bear the burden of bringing this word to the world and bringing the Messiah to the world. And that's God's plan. And the sooner the church understands that, um, I think it's going to be better for all of us. So I'm going to read a part of Almost to the end of Romans 11, you're probably aware Romans 9, 10, 11 deal with the issue of, of the Jewish people. And Paul is bringing his argument to a close here, starting in verse 29, he writes, and he's writing to either a mixed or exclusively non-Jewish Christian audience in Rome at this time. And he says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, theologians have done all sorts of things with this section, trying to make Israel mean something besides Israel. But um, I believe that Israel means Israel means Israel, meaning the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the people who we call the Jewish people today. I get into a little more detail in a small booklet that I wrote on Romans 11. And we, Robin and I brought our books and they're in the, in the, um, the cafe. And uh, so they're going to be for sale um, in there later. Um, and understanding Paul's use of the term Israel, Romans 11 is kind of like the first domino that once that, once you get that and it falls, it helps with all the other, um, what I think are misuses of the term Israel in, in the life of the church. Not all the church, but in a lot of the church. Um, so there are scholars that try to say, even here in verse 26, and in this way all Israel will be saved, that this thing about the Gentiles and the Jews, and in this way all Israel, meaning the new Israel, 
Jews and Gentiles together as the church. But he can't mean that because he says, he quoting from Hebrew scripture, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. He chooses a passage that refers to Israel's originally, original natural name. Jacob, there's no one, no Christian wants to think of themselves as Jacob. I'm happy to think of myself as a son of Jacob, as a Jewish person. God is determined to do what he said he would do. He promised that, that uh, Abraham would have a people, a great people, and he would have a land forever. Our God is a God who keeps promises. If he doesn't keep his promises to Israel, nobody can actually trust that he's going to keep his promises to them. But because he will keep his promise to Israel, despite all the things that we've been through throughout all the centuries, we could trust that his faithfulness endures forever unto all of us. And so this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. But then he goes on. As regards the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. And what this seems to do, Paul is talking here, is as he was traveling around the Roman Empire, usually starting in a a new city by going to the local synagogue. Um, There were people, Jewish people who came to the Lord, non-Jews who would hang out at the synagogue would come to the Lord. And the people that were causing him the most grief, the most, because sometimes there'd be Roman kind of officials that would cause problems. But the people who caused the most grief were synagogue leaders. So they would be Jewish leaders. And it's not because Jewish people are worse than any other people. It's because they were the keepers of the faith. Just like all the other, what we've seen throughout history, when God seeks to do something new and fresh in a church and denomination, who's going to cause the problem? It's going to be the existing leadership. It's just what comes with the territory. It's actually them doing their job. So something different, called strange, comes into this fellowship. Pray that Pastor Kevin stands up, questions, deals with it, and maybe it's something that's bad and he has the grace to kick him out. But being human, it's very easy to think, oh, it's new, it's bad, And we're not seeing that it's God. It's a very, very difficult position to be in. And God chose historically the Jewish people to be in that position. So come on, so cut us some slack, okay? (laughs) So when it talks about enemies, he's talking about in this, not that Jewish people are all bad guys. He's referring to the fact that some Jewish leaders were the main troublemakers in getting in the way of Gentiles coming to faith. So as regard the gospel, they're enemies for your sake, but as regard election, God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. I don't know why in church history, they didn't highlight that part of the verse, but that's very, very clear. It says, verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Ha ha, irrevocable. For just as you, and now there's this, some confusing language here that I'm gonna briefly unpack. We're getting to the end. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Paul started Romans by showing how all people, Jews and Gentiles have blown it before God and need God's grace to, through the Messiah, to be reconciled to God. He kind of comes back to that here, but he gets specific about how this has worked. Now, earlier in Romans 9, 10, 11, particularly Romans 11, he shows how God used how um, the general Jewish unbelief, remember there were thousands of Jewish believers in the first century, but general Jewish unbelief became the opportunity to springboard the gospel to the nations. He explains that uh, in in Romans 11. And so that's why he says, um, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now received mercy because of their disobedience. So when the people were giving a hard time to Paul in the synagogues, it created a greater opportunity to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. God used the nearsightedness of the Jewish leadership to help spread the gospel to the nations. But then he says, so they too have now become disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. So 
a picture that I, I'm trying to paint a picture of this. It's as if um, my family had been anticipating a, an inheritance for, for a long, long time. We heard about this. We knew a little bit about it, not everything about it. But then by the time, and there's even parables that kind of talk like this. By the time it was, when it was time for the inheritance to come due, we didn't want it. For one reason or another, we didn't want it. So the authorities found other people to give these riches to who had no idea about this inheritance that we knew all about. That makes sense? And now they've got it. Or may I say, you've got it. But why do you got it? One of the reasons why you have it is to bring it back to us. It's in, been in your safekeeping, not to go, oh, it was meant for us all along, which is true, because remember, Abraham, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Yes, he chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for you, but not to neglect us, but there's this goal, and it's worked out in this very difficult way where when it finally came to us, we didn't want it, most of us didn't want it, that became the occasion for you to get it, but now that you've got it, what are you going to do with it? And one of the things that God is calling you to do with it is to give it back to the Jewish people. Yeah. That the restoration of Israel to some extent depends upon the church. Mm. It's time to return the mercy of God to the Jewish people, which sadly has not been the story of church history in its relationship to Israel and the Jewish people. And with all that's going on in the world today, and particularly what's going on in the Jewish world today, and not only in the land of Israel, but through the anti-Semitic um, demonstrations that we're seeing all over the world, including here in Ottawa, you have a wonderful opportunity to bring the mercy of God in the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, back to our people. So some final reflections. You have a story. You have a story because our God has a story. And if you know the Lord Jesus, he's integrated, he's been integrating your story all along into his story. And I wonder how many of us are even running away from our own story in all sorts of different ways. Some of us resent our backgrounds. We wish it wouldn't have been that way. We wish we didn't come from that country or have those parents and grandparents. But maybe there's something in there for you to discover that God wants to redeem. You've never been called to be somebody else. You've only been called to be the person that God made you to be. But what is that? And in our understanding of God, do we understand that we're in the middle of a great adventure? And, I know it's, and some of this great adventure is scary, painful, difficult, disappointing, really, really hard. But what a difference it makes when we get a glimpse that there's a great story unfolding even through each of our individual lives. But what is it? Once you understand that our God is is unraveling his epic story, perhaps you could discover what your role is in that story. When you understand that he created a good earth, yes, that it's gone corrupted, but that essential goodness is still there, then maybe a good life is not just about the spiritual things, as if being in the ministry is the, the, the highest form of service to God. It's the highest form of service to God if that's what you're called to. Your highest service to God might be as a mom right now, changing lots of diapers, or an engineer, or a sanitation engineer, or a place where you don't even know what you're doing right now. You're in that, that place where you're super confused. Everything you try seems to end up in disaster. You know, there's really no unemployment for God's people. It's simply called discipleship because God takes us through all sorts of, of that. and maybe, maybe our problems are our fault. Ask him. God would delight to finally tell you that it's your fault once you're really open to that answer, but maybe it's not. Maybe something else is going on. 
Now, obviously, there is a lot of detail that I had to either skim over or skip over due to the time restraint. So how about bringing me to wherever you are and I could do my whole seminar there. So if you'd like to do something like that, uh, let's let's talk about it. Email me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org, which is also, of course, where you can send any questions or comments about this podcast or any of my other ones that I have posted. And again, please don't forget to subscribe, to like, and to share. And finally, you can also support this podcast by clicking on the support link in the description. And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Thinking Biblically.